Coronary artery disease really need never exist. And if it does exist, it need never progress. Colin, thank you for those kind remarks. It's so exciting to be partnered with people like uh, Dr. Campbell, who has such incredible uh, credentials, who are so generous with their time and have such belief in their convictions and integrity, which is what we really uh, are seeking today. Now, <clears throat> what you see on this screen, that's the uh, building, which is called the Cryle Building, at the Cleveland Clinic. And my office was on the eighth floor of this hospital. And like all hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic is a cathedral of sickness. Those hospitals shine when you crumble. And we want to, we want to change that. Right now, coronary artery disease does not have the, the top headline. How many people in your community are going to die of West Nile virus this year? But how many are going to succumb to cardiovascular disease? We learned from Framingham that one out of every two males in the course of their life will be affected by coronary artery disease, one out of three females. And more recently, the data suggests that the females are catching up with the men. This doesn't start out very well. This is a young couch potato. And if you look carefully, you will see that even the relatives on the wall and the fish <laughs> and, the dog. and the dog, they're not asleep yet. It's always very exciting when you have to speak right after lunch. You kind of uh, <clears throat> are hoping. <laughs> Now, this is back in the days of Sohio at Cleveland. Sohio was the great gas station, which uh, preceded BP. And uh, they just weren't really very public health conscious. <laughs> Dave Thomas, who was the great founder of Wendy's and had many admirable personal qualities at what he did for orphans, but one of his less admirable qualities was that I never heard in any of his advertisements, which he participated in himself, he never described in detail what preceded and what occurred during his quadruple bypass operation. <laughs> you may remember that when Burger, <clears throat> in 1970s, when Burger King, wanted to outdo their competition with advertising. They made a thing called the Whopper. And the, the saying went that it took, took two hands to handle the Whopper. Whose two hands were handling the Whopper? Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain. Where is Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain today? He's died of heart disease. Now, this is not a disease of the elderly. We know <clears throat> from the data from the Korean battle casualties and the Vietnam casualties that when you look without a microscope at the coronary arteries of these young men, an average age 20 years, even without a microscope, there is gross evidence of coronary disease in 80%. So this is not a disease of the young. But what happens if you say, well, how about the civilian population? Recently, there was a study entitled the PADE study, the Pathobiologic Determinants of Atherosclerosis in the Young. These persons in this study had died from accidents, homicides, and suicides. And 
Their ages ranged from 16 to 34. The disease of coronary artery disease was ubiquitous. It is tough, isn't it? Right after, the, after a meal, it's got to get cranked up and listen to coronary disease. <laughs> so the disease is ubiquitous now. It's frightening what's happening to some of the Puerto Rican population in New York where they're drinking so much Coca-Cola and having so much of this food, food that we now know because of their excessive obesity. They have type 2 diabetes in adolescence. And the frightening thing is that they are the first generation that we expect that will not outlive their parents. Nature constantly tries to give us some information about a breakthrough. And when did this great breakthrough in coronary disease begin to come? A little bit in World War I, but especially in World War II, what we found was that when the Axis powers of Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium, and when they occupied Norway, they took away all their sheep, goats, cattle, and their livestock. They lost their dairy. And what happened in Norway? If you, <clears throat> this is Norway, and there, you can see the, how brisk the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease was right up until 1939 when the Axis powers op occupied Norway. And what happened was that with the loss of meat and dairy, there was this absolute plummeting of death from cardiovascular disease only to resume again at, with the cessation of hostilities. Emile Picard is a Belgian pathologist who was telling his students in 1946 and 1947 at the autopsy table, look at the plaques. The plaques are back. We didn't see we didn't see these during the war years, the plaques of return. But there are another great lesson to be learned in the natural history of this disease is there are certain nations by culture, heritage, and tradition that seem to thrive largely on a plant-based diet. And this is where I learned about the importance of detail. If you go to the Papua Highlanders, they're absolutely fascinating because what we always think of as a major risk factor in heart disease is smoking cigarettes. And it's absolutely horrible for many reasons. But there was a remarkable study of the Papua Highlanders when they are actually autopsied beyond the age of 60 when they die. The Papua Highlanders' most serious common source of morbidity is pulmonary, their lungs. Why? Because they absolutely grow this hideously harsh tobacco and they smoke it, not out in the back 40. They build these communal hutches and you not only get a chance to rebreathe your own smoke, but in case you're a little short, you can get everybody else's smoke as well. But the fascinating thing is, when you autopsy these people over the age of 60, their arteries are absolutely clean. Why? What do the Papua Highlanders eat? 19 different varieties of sweet potato. No building blocks. Now bear with me for a minute. This is a yellow arrow. This is a blue arrow. <laughs> this is a coronary artery branch. This yellow arrow now is the point where a cardiologist has inserted a catheter with an ultrasound on it. And the ultrasound makes a picture. And this is the yellow arrow here. And this is that ultrasound device. And this is the outline, nice and smooth, of the artery. And now, we advance. 
the ultrasound from the yellow arrow to the blue arrow. And we take another picture with the ultrasound. And here is the ultrasound machine itself. And here is the artery. But lo and behold, what is this? This wedge here. For years, the gold standard was a coronary angiogram. If you have a coronary angiogram and it's clear, your arteries are okay, right? Wrong. One of the first things the artery does when it fills up with atherosclerosis is it tries to expand. And it's quite remarkable how to a certain point it can still accommodate enough so that you think your vessel is completely healthy and normally normal by that angiogram, and it is not at all, as we see here. Well, what does that mean? Somebody comes to me and says, Dr. Esselstyn, I only have one vessel in my coronary artery tree which is diseased. Uh-uh. Again, when autopsy studies are done, <clears throat> even those with single vessel disease, if they happen to die, as William Roberts, who is presently the editor of the American Journal of Cardiology, took all the arteries off the heart in a line and then made serial section through them. Everybody with coronary artery disease has triple vessel disease. All vessels are enlarged. Now, how does a heart attack occur? We thought for years that this lovely normal artery here, and you can see this little fringe on the inside. I'm going to be talking about this some more today. This is called the endothelium. This obviously is an artery that has had many, many cheeseburgers and ice cream and chocolate. And you might say, well, when this little pinhole finally closes off, the person's going to have a heart attack. Yeah, maybe 12 or 15 percent. There is newer thinking about this. Even though this person may occlude, shut off this artery, they're not going to be necessarily, it doesn't have to be a heart attack downstream because this plaque has occurred so long and so slow that little tiny collaterals have occurred alongside it which will nourish or sustain the viability of that downstream heart muscle. So even if that shuts off, the angina may get worse, but you might not have a heart attack. However, 85% of heart attacks will occur, not from those large plaques. The dangerous plaques are the smaller ones that are occupying no more than 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50% of the lumen of the artery. And as you see here, this is a cross section of an artery, and here is a plaque occupying about 35% of the diameter of this vessel. And most heart attacks occur in the following manner. When your so-called good bad L your <clears throat> when your your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol, your bad cholesterol is your LDL, but there is two forms of LDL cholesterol, your fluffy puffy LDL, which is not so bad. But when you eat the American diet and you oxidize your fluffy puffy LDL into the small hard dense LDL, it gets into this foam cell in the plaque and Peter Libby from Harvard has shown us that when your small, hard, dense LDL is... Now, this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show today. Well, I'm taking a few minutes on it. This foam cell now begins to elaborate these nasty substances, these enzymes, which will begin to erode this little thin cap covering. And it especially erodes it at where the shoulder of this plaque is meeting the arterial wall, right up here at the proximal end where it is now, when it gets as thin, let's say, as a cobweb, the sheer force of blood ripping and tearing and rolling over this weakened cap over the plaque, it tears. And when that has torn, you will now have the loss or extravasation of this plaque content going out into the flowing blood where it activates platelets and now you begin to get the formation of a thrombus which in a few moments or minutes is going to be completely occluding 
This artery, which has never had a chance to develop any collateral, so that all the muscle downstream is going to be immediately deprived of blood supply, and that results either in a significant heart attack or perhaps a sudden death. So when dear old Uncle Ned, who was never sick a day in his life, walks out, slides in behind the steering wheel of the pickup truck, and then collapses and dies. Why? Because he was never sick with heart disease. But this is the way it goes when the plaque ruptures. So what we're going to have to learn today, how to do, what can you do so that within three weeks you can make it so that that cap will never rupture. If you cannot rupture your cap of your plaque, you have made yourself heart attack proof. Now, I wrote a paper in 2000 that said, in cholesterol lowering, moderation kills. I cannot stand the word moderation in this particular setting. Why? Because <clears throat> what happens is we have to look back in the 1990s when there were a whole slew of large-scale randomized studies with the statin drugs. And the statin drugs were really quite remarkable. They lowered your cholesterol. You didn't change your diet at all, and it still lowered your cholesterol. But what happened was they found in these large studies 30% fewer new heart attacks, 30% fewer heart attack deaths, 30% fewer interventions needed. My question was, what about the other 70%? This is not cancer. This is a benign disease. Why do you have to die from this? Because it wasn't simply treated. It was moderation. Now, presently, the big push on coronary disease, we get ever and ever more sophisticated in how we do the operation for bypass, how we do the angioplasty, and how we do the, the stent. Now they got a stent coated with sirolimus that is not supposed to shut down. But what do we do? If we look back over the last decade, 250,000 people, a quarter of a million people die immediately when they have these procedures. I'm not talking about those that die later. I'm talking about those that die with the procedure. And there's a significant morbidity with infection, heart attacks, and strokes. An expense, Eugene Bronwald at the Shattuck Lecture in Harvard mentioned that the present cardiology budget for the United States is over a quarter of a trillion dollars. And the sad thing is with all these in interventions, what's happening? The benefits erode with the passage of time. We got to do better than that. So I ask my patients to look at coronary disease as a raging brush fire. Remember those endothelial cells that I mentioned a few minutes ago that line the inside of the artery? There are 700 square meters of endothelial cells in your body. And that large, think of it as a large, large tennis court. And your heart disease is that that tennis court is ablaze. What does moderation do? If you think of roast beef and ice cream and chocolate, and if your cardiologist says, eat lean roast beef, or only have it once or twice a week, let's go out and pour gasoline on the fire once or twice a week. <laughs> and you wonder, and you wonder why patients the good old boy, he fought hard, he had his first bypass, and then six or eight years later, he had his second bypass, and he couldn't have any more. He hung on 12 years after his heart. He never had a disease treated. How do you treat the disease? You don't talk about moderation. Because if you say moderation to one person, they'll say, oh, God, I'm not going to have that birthday cake tonight. But the other person will say, yeah, I heard Dr. Esselstyn. He said it's not good to have that. I'm only going to have half of it. So moderation means different things to different people. When I first started giving this presentation years ago, this was, a, this was kind of a joke. <laughs> Halfway through his hearty man breakfast, Duane thought he heard some of his smaller arteries slamming shut. 
Robert Vogel did the classic study. There have now been 10. We know that with a single meal, you absolutely injure your endothelial cell. How do we measure that? If you put an ultrasound on your brachial artery in your arm and you measure it, you can get an idea of the diameter. Then you put a blood pressure cuff on your arm and you squeeze it off the, so there's no blood supply to your arm for five minutes. Then you release it. And then you measure again the ultrasound. And what do you find? The diameter is markedly increased. Compensatory vasodilatation, flow mediated dilatation. Vogel took these medical students and divided them in half. One half at McDonald's got the cornflakes, the other half got the McMuffin breakfast. And what do you think happened to the brachial artery tourniquet test? No change in those on the cornflakes. And those getting the McMuffin breakfast after 120 minutes, you completely markedly reduced lost that compensatory vasodilatation. And that has been shown many, many times. And it's profound. And this is why I think, as you'll see, in our particular study, and I think in, in everybody who deals with this, attention to detail is important. These days, before I counsel somebody, I ask them, I said, be sure you read my website and be sure you're comfortable with the fact that two things, that A, if I'm going to counsel you, you must be willing to forever eliminate the phrase, this little bit won't hurt. <laughs> and also, if you're going to visit with me, if you're going to have me counsel you, I have no interest in counseling you if you want to just slow the disease. If you want to absolutely annihilate this disease, I'm delighted to try to help. The Monell Chemical Census, this goes back to what Doug Lyle was speaking about this morning. Doug was aware of this study. The Monell Chemical Census Center took three different groups of patients, those at 34% fat, typical American, 20% fat, and then down around 11 and 12% fat, which is where our uh, program is. And they found that in only one of those three groups do you lose your craving for fat. At 12 weeks, 90 days, three months, and that's in the group that is uh, at 11 and 12 percent. This is what should happen. You put the fire out. I want to share with you the study that I began in the early 80s. I uh, should share that I, at the Cleveland Clinic, I was chairman of our breast cancer task force and head of the section on thyroid and parathyroid surgery, but my disillusionment with my surgery most profoundly occurred with breast cancer. And no matter how much of this surgery we did, the line wasn't getting any shorter, and I was not ever doing anything for the next unsuspecting victim. And it looked like a pretty nasty epitaph to think that this man did X thousands of mastectomies or partial mastectomies, and and there had to be a better way. So first I dug into the literature and found that in Kenya, breast cancer was 20 times less frequent. In Japan in the 1950s, it was practically unheard of, but when Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second generation, they now had breast cancer at the same rate as their Caucasian counterparts. Powerful. Prostate, even more powerful. In 1958, how many men in Japan died? Autopsy proven of cancer of the prostate. 18. There'll be that many off of the staff at the Cleveland Clinic in the next two or three years. Well, how can anything that, that, that powerful, we have an epidemic in this country. I'm not talking about West Nile disease. This is, these are epidemics that are very real and very powerful. So <clears throat> at, uh, after reviewing this, I just didn't see any way with my resources that I could do a cancer related to nutrition and neoplastic disease or cancer. And since, cardi since coronary disease seems closely correlated with these population studies, it seemed like a very appropriate thing to take the leading killer, especially because it was a benign disease. And there had been work to suggest that this could be changed and it could be possibly even 
uh, reversed. So I uh, mentioned to you about the epidemiological data, and I started with 24 uh, patients, all who had severe triple vessel disease. The study was limited for several reasons. One, I still had to earn a living as a surgeon. And secondly, uh, I was allowed one half day a week for this research. Now, also, the rock upon which this study was most likely to flounder was patient compliance. And I'm, I didn't have the, the, the skills that Doug Lyle has. I kind of had to go by the seat of my pants. When I went to uh, the cardiologist uh, to see if I get some support, they said, oh, for, you know, forget it. That cholesterol thing is a myth. There's not really any relationship there. So I went to our, our senior dietitian with a national reputation, and she said, nobody's ever going to eat that diet. So I really knew I was on the right track. <laughs> and, and so, and that was, to get compliance, I borrowed a, a phrase from a, a Bert Dunphy, who was a surgeon I had great respect for from the West Coast, who said this about treating cancer patients. Cancer patients are not afraid to suffer. And they're not afraid to die. But they are afraid of being abandoned by their family or their physician. And I wanted to make it doggone sure that these patients knew that they were never going to be abandoned. And then we had a few other compliance strategies. So therefore, the first five weeks, I saw these patients, myself, every two weeks and went over every morsel they ate and we drew their uh, blood cholesterol. We had to give them specific goals too. I think this helps any time that you're saying, don't just say cut down on your red meat or take the skin off the chicken. Give them goals. I wanted them to eat a totally plant-based diet like we see in those cultures where the disease is unheard of. And I also wanted them to achieve the same blood cholesterol, blood lipid levels that we see in those nations, like Colin Campbell's world Chinese for you range between 90 and 150. How many Americans have a cholesterol of 150? <laughs> it's very hard to find, Nat naturally, I mean, not living on a statin drug. So keep the cholesterol under 150, the LDL under 80, and have an 11% plant-based diet. I was so frightened moving out of my area of expertise into the cardiology arena that I used a belt and suspenders method. Although I was, I was totally committed to the nutritional dietary program, uh, I wanted to give them a little nudge from a cholesterol lowering medication as well. We did uh, allow them any, any unstructured exercise. If they wanted to, they could meditate. I did not ask meditation and relaxation and Structured exercise was not a part of the program. Why? Because I hadn't found in any of my research that these nations that didn't have this disease didn't have it because of meditation or, or exercise, but it was because of culture, heritage, and tradition. They didn't eat any of the atherosclerotic building blocks. And also my concern was if, if you take people and ask them to do too many things, that 20 minutes in the morning you have to meditate and then you've got 40 minutes of structured exercise at night and then 20 more minutes of meditation plus the most significant nutritional change you've ever known, each of us has within us just so many behavioral modification units. I wanted every one of those behavioral modification units to be focused on the nutrition. You don't Gain points by 15 more minutes on the exercise on bike on Tuesday does not entitle you to a hot fudge Sunday on uh, Friday night because what we were trying to do was once these patients down-regulated their fat receptor, we have receptors for cocaine, heroin, nicotine, but as soon as you can be off the fat for these 90 days, you down-regulate the receptor, 
then you don't have a sense of denial. You're not miserable. Your angina is improving. Your weight is lost. You're meeting the goals of the study, and it becomes terribly exciting. What do we have to meet? Whole grains, legumes, lentils, vegetables, and fruit. You've all familiar and heard about this. No oil, fish, fowl, meat, or dairy. No oil. No oil. <laughs> Let's just take a moment here because some people still are not clear about the fact. No oil. <laughs> All right, why? Because the data. Olive oil is terribly seductive. Scott Gundry did some studies that are very short term that showed that it increases your good cholesterol, lowers your bad cholesterol, improves your ratio. It got a huge amount of press. Doctors heard about it, and therefore it must be wonderful, right? Wrong. Because you look at longer term studies, Blankenhorn, right in the California, two groups of patients, one saturated fat, the other monounsaturated like olive oil, the baseline angiogram at the end of the year, the angiogram disease of coronary disease had progressed just as much in each group. Lawrence Rudell and the Research Triangle took the African green monkey, some similar lipid metabolism to man, saturated, unsaturated, five years. In the monounsaturated olive oil group, higher HDL, lower LDL, better ratio, autopsy, just as much coronary disease. The oil companies didn't like that, so Lawrence Riddell repeated the study with rodents, and the result, the same. Dr. Vogel has gone on and shown us, indeed, that olive oil activates clotting factor 7 just as much as butter. And Vogel, in a separate study, and Ong, in a separate study, have shown how it impairs flow-mediated dilatation that I just talked to you about, the brachial artery tourniquet test. And last month, in the Journal, uh, the journal of, the, of, the, of the National Cancer Institute, uh, olive oil, along with meat and dairy, is implicated in uh, a risk factor for uh, breast cancer. Well, that wasn't quite enough because I do get the Harvard Heart Letter, and I have great respect for Thomas Lee, who's the editor. But one of those heart letters said, for heart patients, be sure you use the heart-healthy oils, canola oil, olive oil. So I wrote to Dr. Lee. I said, dear, <laughs> dear Dr. Lee, I have, have always had the highest regard for your Harvard Heart uh, Letter, but I was puzzled and skeptical by your recommendation for oils for patients with heart disease. And I enclose for your review uh, these six articles and references that I'm aware of that <clears throat> suggest that this is not a good idea, and I also enclose for you a copy of my study. And six months later, <clears throat> I got a letter back from Dr. Lee, dear Dr. Esselstyn, thank you for your reprints in your study. Uh, I would agree with you that as we move forward in this most complex of diseases, that we should remain flexible. <laughs> no oil. No fish, fowl, meat, and dairy. The key would be the initial meeting with the, with the patient and the spouse. You, I cannot underestimate the importance of this. Uh, you've got to give them the whole background of the disease like you're getting today and get into the, the business of how, the, how they eat the recipes and how they could market and get their food. See them, as I mentioned, twice a day, excuse me, twice a, twice a month for the first five years, once a month for the second five years, and then once a year, excuse me, once quarterly. And I think that made our study the the, the longest uh, arrest and reversal study uh, of uh, that duration. In addition, the first five years we would have periodic group gatherings about every three or four months, either our house or one of the participants, and the ticket of admission was one or two of your favorite legal recipes, because recipes was what we were always looking back for back in the uh, mid and early 80s. 
And they, uh, they liked the idea that both my wife and I were eating this way. This is a, just a, one of our gatherings. They started with cholesterol at 237. And then <clears throat> at five years, they uh, had, I think, the lowest total cholesterol in the literature for studies of this type. LDL, HDL held steady. LDL was 76. We like it under 80. Most cardiologists like to get it down to 110, 100. Triglycerides, 143. And again, at 12 years, they were still well under 150, the stable LDL. And as a result, <clears throat> they uh, did very well. Now, the angiograms. I'm going to. These angiograms that you're about to see were the follow-up angiograms that they had at five years in, a, in, a, in, a, in 11 or 12 of these patients. These angiograms were reviewed in triplicate in the angiography core laboratory at our, physician, at our uh, facility by two senior technicians who have great skill at national trials in comparing these. Why am I going to take a moment to say this? Can't, can't a cardiologist just flip this up on his screen and have the experience to say this is an 80 or 90 percent blockage or this is 70 percent? No. Because when this was done routinely, the cardiologist never recognized it. What I'm showing you here is the smallest improvement that your eye can see in a 67-year-old retired pediatrician. And what happens where the arrow is here and here, when that is reviewed in triplicate with a six-month gap so that to avoid bias of recall, this is a, I can say with accuracy that this is a 10% improvement. This vessel here happens to be a 20% uh, improvement. And in a 58-year-old uh, factory worker, in a retired security guard, this is in the right coronary artery, this is a 30% improvement. And this was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Joe Crow. And I use his name freely because I've had him at national meetings. Joe, at age 44, replaced me as the uh, breast cancer force chairman. And at age 44, he had a cholesterol of 156. He had no family history. He was not a smoker. He was not overweight. He, did, he was not diabetic. And he began getting chest pains in October of 1996. And he saw cardiology. And they said he was fine. And four weeks after he had seen the cardiologist, he finished his surgical schedule and was writing post-operative orders in the operating room when suddenly the elephant began sitting on his chest, crushing weight. Severe pain in his left shoulder and down his arm. Joe Crow was having a heart attack. Now, he was immediately taken down to the angiography suite, and he had, quote unquote, a normal, normal coronary arteries except for the lower end of his left anterior descending, which we call the Widowmaker. The lower end of the left anterior descending had this sort of moth-eaten look, and it was far too long a segment to have an angioplasty or a stent, and it was too far down in the artery to successfully have a bypass. So Joe was feeling very disconsolate and depressed with three young kids and a wife, and so we had him out to the house two weeks after his heart attack, and Ann and I went over things, and Joe, I said, look, we've got 10 years of data now on this study. I think you know, you have been eating the horrible, toxic American diet. I think you've got to go plant-based. And he said, I'll do it, but I'm not going to take the cholesterol-lowering drug. Joe Crow became the absolute personification of commitment to the plant-based diet. His cholesterol went from 156 before his heart attack to 89, just like a rural Chinese. His bad cholesterol went from 98 to 38, and after not five years, but after two and a half years, he had another angiogram. And as you can see, look what nature did. 
Now, you're not going to see that with all plaques. Plaques, if you carefully look at them and analyze them, are made up of calcium, which you're probably not going to be able to budge. A lot of scar tissue, you can't change. <clears throat> but that component, which is made up of soft lipid gruel, you can often get some significant reduction. And that, I think, is exactly obviously what seemed to happen to, uh, to Dr. Crow. Now, pictures are fun, but what about the patients? How did they do? I recognized within the first uh, 12 to 15 months that there were six of these patients who simply were not compliant. And they, uh, I was on an absolute bare bones research budget, and so with their understanding, I said, look, I'm going to re return you to your expert cardiologist for care. You don't have to depend on this general surgeon for your care, but I will insist upon from time to time, I just want to see how you're doing and what's going on with you. Those patients, over the next 12 years, those six patients who dropped out, four of the six had to have a, <coughs> excuse me, a bypass operation. One of them had an angioplasty and the other died. Of, the re of those remaining 18 patients who stayed with us, we looked at what happened to them eight years prior to the study, and they had had 49 coronary events while under the hands of expert cardiologists ranging from increasing angina, disease progression by angiography, bypasses, strokes, heart attacks, need for angioplasty or worsening stress test, and in the 12 years on the study, 17 of those patients had no further events. We had one little sheep who wandered from the flock. At six years, he got a little confident, a little cocky, started eating the wrong, no, no dairy, no milk. What did he eat? He began eating foods in packages and bottles that said fat-free. By government, the FDA in, in 1993 said to the food manufacturer, you can say zero fat per serving if the serving has less than a half a gram myotalics of artery clogging fat. So what happened was, when you have Eneman's morning breakfast pastry, my granddaughter is going to have five slices, but the He-Man is going to have ten. Now each of those ten slices have a half a gram of artery clogging fat, but the He-Man doesn't have it alone. He's going to have, right, zero fat per serving promise. Not one, two swipes. So he's now had two, of the, uh, two swipes of the zero fat per serving promise, each of which has a half a gram of artery clogging fat. But he was so good at breakfast, come lunchtime, he has the zero-fat Kraft mayonnaise, the zero-fat salad dressing, and the zero-fat Alpine Lay's cheese. So, now, with your fat-free day going so fine, you come home at night, into the kitchen, wrap your arms around your sweetie, and look over her shoulder at the kitchen counter, and then whisper into her ear, oh, sweetheart, this little bit can't hurt. Is it any wonder that anybody can arrest their heart disease. The flame is not going to go out. You can't put the fire out if you keep feeding it with these zero-fat per serving products. You've got to learn how to read ingredients, not the white label that the government gives you. Read the ingredients. Are there mono or triglycerides? Is there partially hydrogenated? Is it hydrogenated? Is there glycerin? You've got to know that is the absolute fundamental, the important thing to detail. Now, if we review, what happens is, compared to the intervention approach, there's no mortality from the diet, there's no morbidity from the diet, and what happens with the passage of time? It does nothing but continue to improve. And the thing is, it's so exciting, not to the cardiologist or the cardiac surgeon. The excitement here is that the locus of control of this disease is in the hands of the patients, and that's extremely empowering. And it's so empowering also because how many people have a situation where Uncle Joe, who has had a heart attack, and neither Uncle Joe or Mrs. Uncle Joe or relatives don't know when he's going to have his next heart attack? That is a huge burden for a family to constantly live in this absolute fear of when the other shoe is going to fall. But if you make yourself heart attack proof, then that 
fear goes out the window. Now, quickly we want to go through a couple of other organ systems. If you look at 500 Swedes who are over the age of 85, one third will have dementia. Well, that's not a nice, exciting thing to have. You work all your life, and then you get into retirement, you get to be these senior years, and then you have uh, cerebral drift. And they studied it carefully, found out one half of that one third was due to vascular disease, and by now you know that doesn't have to happen. But there was a fascinating study done by Megan Cleary at the stroke meetings in February of 2001 in, in Miami, where what did she do? She and her team looked at 11,000 MRIs of the brain, and what did they find at age 50? Many Americans begin noticing in their MRIs, there's little unidentified white spots, which we now know are small strokes. You keep walking, you keep talking, there's a lot of reserve in your brain, and you just have these little strokes. But if they continue and you're now in your late 60s and into your 70s, memory begins to go. Then cognition goes. And then when Grandpa comes downstairs in his basement on Sunday morning in his bathing suit asking for waffles, we got problems. <laughs> that is a normal MRI. Nice and dark throughout here, except for these uh, fissures. But this, I counted these the other day. There are over 90 lesions, severe. Suppose we start doing, suppose we ought to start doing this on our Supreme Court justices, <laughs> checking them out. <laughs> this is probably one of the most under-recognized organs in the body, the ascending aorta. When your left heart squeezes, all the blood goes into this enormous pipe we call the aorta. It goes up for about three and a half to four centimeters. And just like you gather debris in your coronary artery, you gather debris in your ascending aorta. And if you've been in surgery and you open the aorta, especially in the abdomen in these patients, and you tap, just wipe your finger around the back of it, it comes up like cheese. you're going through cheesecake. Very loosely applied. So Aramenko in France did a fascinating study where he took patients who had a, a tendency to have high risk factors and he had them do what we call transesophageal echocardiography where they simply swallowed a tube with a little ultrasound probe and it anatomically is very, very close to the aorta so you could get pictures of how much atherosclerotic debris was in that aorta and he graded it between those who had one millimeter of debris to one point, to one, to one, to three, three point nine and those who had over three point nine millimeters of debris. And they followed them for three years and which group had the highest rate of stroke? Yes, the group uh, with over 3.9 millimeters of debris. But where it really shows up every day, and this is very un undiscussed, when you have a coronary artery bypass operation, the surgeon has to place a clamp across the ascending aorta. He doesn't go sideways. He just needs to get a little cuff on the side. So as he's in placing this, we call it the Satinsky clamp, so he can get a little cuff of tissue to insert the, the bypass graft into. When he, says, when he says clamping, if at the same time you are monitoring the middle cerebral artery with an ultrasound, you will hear this whoosh. Why? All that debris has been loosened from that aorta and it goes up into your brain through the pass, path of least resistance right up here. And if you happen to have a quadruple bypass, that's times four. And if you have another bypass two or four years later, it's four more times. And it's not surprising, some of these people have a significant encephalopathy, they can't hold their job. And as John McDougall and I were talking at uh, lunch, up to 52%, uh, lose up to 20% of their cognitive capacity as, as me measured by neuropsychologically testing. This was in the New England Journal about a year and a half ago. But not many bypass surgeons look you in the eye and say, I'm going to take away your, some of your cognition. One of my patients in coming to the, got through the block long Skyway to my office had to stop five times because of severe pain in his calf. We call it a claudication because of poor circulation. We got so focused on his heart that we sort of forgot about his leg. But when he first came in, I did have him go to the vascular lab. And this was his pulse volume then at the, on the time of his first visit. Eight months later, he said to me, Dr. Esselstyn, we've been so focused on my heart, I forgot to tell you that I don't stop five times coming to your office. Two and a half months ago, I found that I didn't stop four, three, two. I don't stop at all. Okay, Don, 
back to the vascular lab, and I think you can see the amplitude of the pulse is significantly increased. There was no mechanical intervention of the artery in his leg. He simply did this, or allowed his body to do this with profound cholesterol reduction. Now, this is a study that I'm going to try to finish up this year. I got uh, very in interested in the fact that many patients, when I first would start counseling them, would come back and say, within 10 days or two weeks, my chest pain was getting better. Well, how can that be? Have they washed out all that plaque? No, that hasn't happened that rapidly. But something else has. And I thought we ought to try to get some science into this. This is a PET rubidium dipritamol scan where the isotope being carried by the blood will show up in the heart muscle. And if it, if it shows up uniformly and completely you're, uh, as yellow or orange, you're okay. But this green patch in this 58-year-old school bus driver from Youngstown who came in with a cholesterol of 261 at baseline, I saw him that afternoon. We went at him with hammer and tongs and he got his cholesterol down to 126 in 10 days and then six weeks later we repeated the scan and he is completely reperfused here. Now what seems to be going on as we see also in this 75 year old retired tool and die maker to cholesterol 248 and you can see this whole wall is really bad. Now this isn't as Dean showed us the other night of somebody who had this repeated after a year or 18 months. This is at six weeks. This is actually one at 12 weeks where he had restored his flow. This one is particularly fascinating because you can see a progression. In this view, it's, you're supposed to look kind of like a donut, and here he is at rest. This individual had a cholesterol of 290. The only thing that was higher was his weight. He was a retired barber from Sandusky, and he was lying in the intensive care unit at the clinic with angina, at rest, lying flat, had failed two bypass operations. And he was wonderfully compliant, though, but you can see he really had a very, very poorly perfused heart muscle here. And we did this not at only at baseline, but look, in 10 days, he knocked his cholesterol down from 290 to 130. He's my champ for that. And in three weeks, he was beginning to get a little bit better perfusion here. And by six weeks, he had really gotten it all together. He had the unmitigated temerity to call me from the 18th hole of the golf course, complaining that he still occasionally had a little chest discomfort, which went, eventually went away when his weight went down to 250. And there he is again. Now, this is the most exciting one. And this is what got me very inspired about the next path that my research will take. This was a stockbroker with a cholesterol of 248, and here he was not perfusing right here. And he came back, they got his cholesterol down to 137. He came back and we did this at three weeks. And he was reperfusing. The green is gone. Now, let's get smarter. I think I can be a lot. What is, what is happening here is that when you lower cholesterol, you immediately begin to re restore the capacity of the, of the coronary artery endothelium, the inner lining of the coronary artery endothelium. Those cells make the nitric oxide. Once they have been restored to make nitric oxide, now that is the most powerful vasodilator the body makes. So that this whole coronary vascular tree, despite these lumps and bumps and plaques upstream, the whole coronary vascular tree under stress, now it doesn't <coughs> vasoconstrict, it widens. And according to Poisset's law of throw through the hollow tube is related to the fourth power of the radius, we get an enormous increase in flow with a small increase in diameter. Now, why is it exciting? It's exciting because if we can do it in three weeks, maybe we can do it in one week. And if we can do it in one week, who's going to want to have a bypass, an angioplasty, or a stent? And if we can somehow get into the head of the insurance companies that, is, that Brussels sprouts and broccoli are cheaper than the stents, uh, we may make some progress. These again are those endothelial cells right in here, 700 square meters of endothelial cells, the largest endocrine system in your body. 
We want to have you heal your endothelial cells in three weeks, thicken the cap, shrink the plaque, and now you've made yourself heart attack proof. Homocysteine is a rascal that, like coronary disease, is a risk factor. And by being sure that you have plenty of folate, B6, and B12 in your diet, and, don't eat, and you're eating a, a sensible plant-based diet, this should not have to be an issue. If you want to know what your coronary arteries are like without getting a catheterization through your groin with a, with a wire and a catheter shoved up into your coronary arteries, as we see here on the left, on the right, this is a cardiac CT. The software is so sophisticated now at the Cleveland Clinic that you can get beautiful pictures of your coronary arteries just by doing this cardiac CT. Here they are at the base of the aorta. This is a lovely picture of the coronary artery. This is another view from above. And I think that that is really elegant, especially if patients who are reluctant to want to change and don't, don't think they have any coronary disease. This can be quite uh, convincing. And here is another view of the same. Just in case a few of you thought the oil thing wasn't serious. <laughs> this I've uh, really I borrowed from Colin Campbell, just to hammer that oil thing one more time, because look at the difference. Here was Colin in 1997 at the Second National Conference on the Elimination of Coronary Disease, and they were asking him, well, Dr. Campbell, why is it there is such a difference in coronary disease, as we see here, from this Mediterranean area? And Dr. Campbell said, well, I, since they're both eating the same kinds of vegetables, grains, and fruit, it's due to, uh, in my opinion, to olive oil. Now, we do have a struggle. And what we're struggling against are physicians, the media, the government, and our national health organizations. And that's what makes this business exciting. If everybody was doing this and there was no challenge, who would want to do it? So we've got some work to do. The American Heart Association and the National Cholesterol Education Program recommend 30% less calories from fat and up to 200 milligrams of cholesterol. Remember, 35% of the people in the Framingham study who developed heart disease had cholesterols between 150 and 200. You follow these recommendations, it's a guarantee that millions of Americans will perish. This is the National Research Council in 1989 in their classic compendium, nutrition, uh, Diet and Health. And in the conclusion, they say that there is evidence that further reductions in fat may confer even greater health benefits. However, the recommended levels are more likely to be adopted by the public because they can be achieved without drastic changes in dietary patterns. Why not just tell the public the truth? Let them decide to what degree they want to be compliant. Why not? Why give them evidence that is incorrect? And here's this you know, Framingham. Now my own institution I have to take a little crack at. This is now up to, I believe it's over uh, eight years we're considered number one in the row. This is for uh, bypass angioplasty and stents, not prevention. Because this goes on on the second floor. On the first floor, we actually build the disease. This is uh, our hospital. That was, uh, that was McDonald's. This is Pizza Hut at the clinic. And these are all my friends and the staff over the last 35 years who have crumbled from either strokes and heart attacks to some degree. And, but we didn't get it right. Just a few weeks ago, we had another. Now, this, though, may be a crack in the wall. Eric Topol is the acknowledged one of the great leaders in cardiology in this country. And he has been acknowledged for all of his interest in mostly it's been all these intervention procedures. But he was the author of a study of some 600,000 patients where they looked at whether or not there were risk factors that caused heart disease. A lot of doctors say that half of my patients don't have risk factors. They looked and they found indeed in truth, over 95% of patients indeed had at least one risk factor. And his conclusion was, these studies certainly blow away the myth of bad genes. We cannot cure this disease until we address the fundamentals of lifestyle. And we hope that that may be a really a very powerful thing. So those of us huh, who look at this uh, profession, the 20th century was really the century of, of great breakthroughs. And now what we've got to do is we've got to take it beyond that 
we can't just keep, keep trying to mend people when they've fallen apart. We have got to have the 21st century be the, the century of prevention. And we've got to be careful. This is the elephant and this is the baby chick. <laughs> Some nations don't need this kind of instruction. But these guys are in great trouble. And what you want to do with your clean arteries, your arteries at 90 ought to look like they did at age 9. And I'm always fascinated by the idea that Dr. Uh, uh, oh, the fellow who ran, who runs the tire company who spoke yesterday? Yes. yes. Uh, he talked about the importance of persistence and passion. And this happens to be a young lady who was trying to learn to do the splits in Life magazine back in the 19, late 1930s. And with great passion and persistence, somebody came across her the other day in Seattle. And indeed, uh, she had got it right. <laughs> and I think that uh, on that particular note, I want to say one final thing to this audience. Recently I spoke at the uh, North American Vegetarian Conference and I heard Michael Greger's tape and he talked about how vegans are dying of heart disease and they have cholesterols well into their 200 and 230. That really is unacceptable. And I, when I think that you've got to understand the importance of detail, I don't have time in a talk like this to get into it. But you have to know your numbers. I'm not addressing now some phantom people out there who are not vegans and that all of you are automatically protected here. You're not protected. If you go out to your best friend's house for a meal and belly up to the trough, you're not protected. What do you do if when you eat out, do you know what is going on in that kitchen? Do you know that your cholesterol, without a cholesterol-lowering drug, is always under 150 and your LDL is under 80? Know your numbers. Get the feedback. We don't want to have you get those little white spots. You're too precious to all of us. Thank you.